I think that's the mistake that most Christians make. A lot of us are very eager to make our point and to tell people that homosexuality is wrong. And most of the time we jump to either this passage or one of the passages, for example, in 1 Corinthians 6 or in 1 Timothy 1, where it specifically says homosexuality is bad. But we don't actually do the groundwork of explaining why it's bad. And if we don't explain why it's bad, then we do just sound like bigots. We do just sound like killjoys that are like, nope, you can't do that. Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Since it is Gay Pride Month, and that's been everywhere, social media, regular media, TV, radio, whatever, it's all over the place. Yes, I'm sick of it. I'm sure that most of the people that are watching me right now are sick of it as well. But I did want to answer this question because I think that it is something that bears repeating. And because we're constantly bombarded with it, I think that we do need to take a look at what is the correct Christian way to approach a month-long celebration of sin. Because this is something that, frankly, is not completely new to the Christian world throughout our entire history. We have dealt with societies and civilizations that would glorify and celebrate sin. American society in 2021 is no different. And so there's a, a number of different historical events we could go to, but I thought it would make sense for us just to spend most of our time in Scripture. Because I have learned time and time again, if you just stick to the Scripture, it's really hard to screw that up. And so even though I typically give a lot of my opinion, I feel that it just makes sense for us to go to the scripture first. Ultimately, I believe, and I'm going to prove this through the scriptures that we visit this evening, that homosexuality at its core is, of course, a sexual sin, so lust is involved, but it is primarily a sin of pride. And we're going to go over that this evening. So first, we're going to go to the book of 1 John. This is chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. Do you notice in this verse how homosexuality fits all three of these ingredients? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Ultimately, it fits all of these things. Every single one of them can be found in these verses. And if you look in verse 17, the world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God continues to live forever. So this is an important part of this verse because specifically, it talks about the world and the lust being something that is temporary. And this makes sense to us because in a lot of ways, our flesh, our flesh and the temporal world are things that are not going to be permanent staples of Christian life. And so it's important for us to understand that when John is drawing this contrast here, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, he's saying that is, in a sense, a summary of what everything the world has to offer is. Homosexuality is all of those things. It's obviously the lust of the flesh because it's a sexual act. It's the lust of the eyes because there are people that look at people with the, the same gender as they are and burn in their lust because of that. Now, there's people that do that with heterosexual too, and it can be just as wrong if you're doing that with someone who you're not married to, but it's definitely something that occurs with homosexuality. And then finally, the pride of life. And this is something that I think that they have sort of accidentally shown their hand on. The fact that they call it Gay Pride and Gay Pride Month, I think is actually terribly appropriate. 
because they are proud and celebrating in their sin. Now, I think that part of this is an overcompensation because there is some small part of them that understands this is a wrong thing to do. This is something that is against their own nature. I think most of them have probably gotten to the point now that they've deadened themselves to that. But on some level, there is some consciousness of knowing that this is not something that is appropriate or something that is within God's will. And because of that, they try to overcompensate and celebrate it. You saw in the video we saw of Blue's Clues where they were showing the gay pride parade. They're like, they love proudly, they love proudly, pride, they love proudly, happy pride month. They say it over and over and over again because they think somehow that if you are proud of your sin, then it's not really sin. If it's something that you're not ashamed of, if you don't feel guilt in or you try to convince yourself that you don't feel any guilt for it, then it must not be wrong. And for somebody that thinks that everyone is their own moral compass and their own moral arbiter, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you can convince yourself it's not wrong, then it's not wrong if every sin is subjective. If morality is just based on the person, then all you have to do is work yourself to where you don't feel personally bad about your sin anymore, and then the sin must not be a sin anymore. It must be okay if you don't feel bad about it. That's where the pride comes in here. The boastful pride of life means you have taken sin to such a level that you no longer regard it as something to be ashamed of anymore. And that's exactly what John is talking about. But this actually has a correlation with another passage of Scripture. Let's go now to Genesis 3, verse 6. This is talking about the fall of man when Eve is tempted in the garden. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. You notice anything here? She noticed it was good for food, in other words, lust of her flesh, and that it was a delight to the eyes, pretty obvious, lust of the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. Well, now, why would somebody want to be wise? Because of pride. Right here in the original sin, the very first sin that humankind ever committed, all three of the ingredients that John talked about are right there. That's the ingredient for sin. When you have those things, that is what the world has to offer you. And that's exactly what gay pride is, isn't it? It's a combination of those three. Now, there's lots of other sins that take completely different forms other than homosexuality that have those things. I'm not saying that homosexuality is unique in this way. But I'm saying you'll notice that at the core of that is Eve's pride. She wants to be like God, and that's what the devil has promised her. And because of that, she decides to go ahead and eat of the fruit because she wants to be as wise as God. She wants to be basically her own God. It is a sin of displacement. Satan has convinced her that if she eats of the fruit, that she will be like God. She will have essentially displaced God and made herself God. God told her not to eat of that fruit. And in her mind, if she partakes of the fruit, she becomes wise as God. And it also means that she is the master of what she gets to do and not do. In her mind, that's how it works. It is a sin of displacement. And it their core, isn't that what all sin is? It's the assertion that God doesn't know what's actually best for us. What we want or what we decide is actually what's best for us. And so whenever we sin, it is a, it is a rebellion against God. It is a rejection of who God is. And it is us putting ourselves in God's place, saying we get to make the decisions about what is right for us. Guys, that's all homosexuality is. Or transgenderism or whatever else all of the different isms that come with that. Because what it says to God is, you don't get to decide who I love. I'm going to love whoever I want to proudly. But isn't that just saying to God, no, no, you're not God, I'm God. I get to decide those things. Transgenderism, same thing. No, no, you don't get to decide whether I'm male or female God. That's not up for you to decide for me. I get to decide that. 
I will make my own choices. Ultimately, both of these things are sins of pride. And now we're going to go to another passage that addresses exactly this and sort of builds upon it. So let's go ahead and go to Romans 1, verses 21 through 25, which reads, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their reasonings and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And exchanged the glory of God for the, in, uh, exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of a corruptible mankind, of birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them up to vile impurity in the lust of their hearts, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a falsehood, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. You see how this goes along with that exact same theme? That what has happened is we've displaced God. We have made it to where we get to make our own moral decisions and make our own choices and say, no, no, this isn't a sin, this isn't wrong, this is right, and I've decided that it is right, therefore it is okay. I don't have a problem with it. I don't see the danger here, therefore I get to be God. And that's exactly what is being said here in Romans. He's saying that they have thrown away all sense, all rationale. They have basically become animals. Why? What is their moral principle? Whatever I want in the moment that I want it. Well, if that's the case, then you are just an animal. All you're doing is following your animalistic instincts to wherever they lead. You're not a person. You're not reasoning this out. And so we see a process develop. And this is what Paul is talking about in Romans. First, you forget God. Then you forget reason. Then your heart is darkened. And then you have, as Paul just said, replaced the image of an incorruptible God with a corruptible man, yourself. That is what's happening here. Now we have displaced God out of his rightful place. And we've decided that we're the ones that get to make all of those moral decisions. And when that happens, the final stage in that process is it says God turns them over to their own vile affections to reap what they sow. They are going to sow dishonor in their flesh because that is what they have chosen to do. Dishonor their flesh. Dishonor their creator. Dishonor the purpose of that God put them on this earth for. He gave them their minds. He gave them their bodies. They chose to reject all of that. I'll, make, I'll remake my body to be whatever I want it to be. I'll remake my affections to be whatever I want it to be. And that's the problem with homosexuality. Yes, it is a sexual sin. Nobody denies that. But like most sins, if you dig down deep enough, pride is there waiting at the bottom. It is the first sin. It is the primordial sin. It is the sin that turned the devil from an angel to a devil. It's the reason that he was cast out. Ultimately, pride is the poison at the bottom of every sin. It's the root cause. And that's where we find ourselves right now. Homosexuality may be a different flavor of that poison, but it's the same poison. I mean, it's like eating vanilla cyanide versus cherry cyanide. Okay, you might like one flavor better than the other, but at the end of the day, it's still going to kill you. And so that's really where we kind of stand on that. So I want us to go now to another passage that will probably sound very familiar to you. And this is just a few verses after the passage that we just read in Romans 1, 26 through 27. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged the natural relations for that which is contrary to nature. And likewise, the men, too, abandoned their natural relations with women and burned in their desire toward one another, males with males, committing shameful acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. So the first thing I want you to notice about this is that it says that they are going to reap the benefits of their own error. In other words, you have created an error that is going to lead to error. You have done something wrong, and because of that, your body is going to be dishonored as a result of that. And so 
this is God basically saying like, look, I'm not the one punishing you for this. You've taken a body that was designed to do a very specific thing and chosen to use it in a way that it was never intended to use. It's kind of like, have you ever had to use a screw ham a screwdriver as a hammer? Like you didn't have a hammer around and so you had to take like the, the back of your screwdriver and drive a nail. What happens? Well, the nail is almost always crooked. If it works, it's really hard to flush that nail and you might wind up messing up your screwdriver. And that's exactly what it's like. And I'm not even talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually here. When we use our spirits and we use our flesh to do things that God never designed them to do, I'm not even talking about the physical ramifications, even though Paul is talking about that as well. It does something to our soul that causes us to understand we are using what God gave us for a purpose that he never intended. See, God gave us the blessing. He's the one that created us. He designed us in a specific way. And because of that, he knows what will work best, what setup is best, what process is best, what is the best way for us to live. And if we reject him, then we get what we deserve. It's not like God is standing there thumping us for screwing up. I'm not saying he doesn't occasionally punish because I think that he does even on this side of eternity. Sometimes he does directly punish. But most of the time, it's just more like God says, okay, I'm going to give you up to your affections. I'm going to let you revel in the lifestyle that you've chosen. And the result is not good. And I want you to notice something else too. Do you realize that I just gave you a lesson on homosexuality and I did not start with the verses that condemn homosexuality? We got there, but we got there slowly. And I explained the process and I explained why these verses, uh, why this sin is wrong through verses that didn't start with homosexuality. I think that's the mistake that most Christians make. A lot of us are very eager to make our point and to tell people that homosexuality is wrong. And most of the time we jump to either this passage or one of the passages, for example, in 1 Corinthians 6 or in 1 Timothy 1, where it specifically says homosexuality is bad. But we don't actually do the groundwork of explaining why it's bad. And if we don't explain why it's bad, then we do just sound like bigots. We do just sound like killjoys that are like, nope, you can't do that. And it's arbitrary. It sounds arbitrary when we teach people this. But if you actually do the legwork, and it doesn't take that long. I've only been doing this for about 10 minutes now. If you go into the background and you understand the scripture and you understand why the sin of homosexuality is wrong. People are a lot more apt to understand that and listen. They won't always. Sometimes they'll reject that too. I mean, even Jesus, who was the perfect teacher, got rejected by most people. And so that's not a commentary on you or your teaching or even the scripture. That's just the way that it's going to be most of the time. But if you are willing to put in the time to actually explain to a person why this sin is wrong, it makes a world of difference. It allows them to at least maybe understand a little bit of why you're coming from that standpoint and why you see it the way that you do. And you don't just come off as a killjoy that just has a long list of things that you're not allowed to do. Once you understand that there are consequences that come from this, that it is a self-destructive lifestyle, and that that's the way that you see it, and you're actually trying to help gay people that are caught up in this sin because you believe that it is something that is going to harm them long term. People are a lot more receptive to that, and they should be. That comes with Christ's command to teach the truth in love. And I want us to look at one more Bible verse this evening before we wrap it up. And this comes from that same chapter in Romans, Romans 1, a little bit further down, though, in Romans 1.32. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Up till this point, we have been talking primarily about the sin of homosexuality itself and the people that are engaged in them. And that verse certainly does that. But did you notice what it said at the end there? It says that, the people that reap this reward, they are worthy of death, and not only those that do the same sin, but those that approve of it. Those that 
as the scripture says, approve of those who practice them. There are a lot of Christians that I think mean well, but because they are so ensconced in this worldly philosophy and worldly thinking, they actually think that they're doing the Christian thing by not judging, even though the Bible never condemns judgment wholesale. It, it condemns improper judgment, but it doesn't condemn all judgment. But that's a, a Bible lesson for a different time. They think that the real Christian and loving thing to do is to just not say anything or to tell people that they approve of what they're doing because that just that seems easier and that seems like it's it's more the loving thing to do. This is wrong. And that scripture, which it talks about other sins too, and I'm not ignoring those, but it primarily was addressing people that give themselves up to homosexuality. It ends on that note, that that sin is worthy of death, and those that endorse it, those that approve of it, the approve of those who engage in that practice, they bear the same sin. And so I understand that it's difficult. I understand it's uncomfortable. Sometimes being a Christian is going to be that way. We're supposed to be at odds with the world. That same chapter that we just looked at said, if, if you're a friend of the world, then you're not on God's side. If, if in, in 1 John, it said, if you love the world and if you love the things that it offers, the love of the Father is not in you. And so to love the way that God loves, we have to be willing to tell people when they're wrong. We have to be willing to love them enough to tell them the truth and that this is not a good thing for them to engage in. And if we approve it, then we are guilty of the same sin. If we say, yeah, that's okay, go ahead, you do you, be, be the, what you want to be. If you want to be fine, yeah, that's, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. If we do that, we're guilty of the same sin. And we are leading them down a path and thinking, making them think that God approves of that decision, which is something that we cannot do as Christians. And this is something that I, I do think that we genuinely need to consider in our relations with other people. Now, I'm not saying we need to browbeat people. I don't think that we constantly need to just be a bullhorn that's always saying homosexuality is a sin, even though it is. And I do think that we need to address that. And we need to tell people if we find them engaged in that. But ultimately, I don't think that browbeating people is a productive way to handle that, but I also don't think that being silent is something that we can do and still be Christians. And so, you know, handle it with love and grace and, and try to do exactly what I did, which is explain the basis and the reason why homosexuality is wrong, not just the fact that God says it's, it's bad. But also don't remain silent either. And don't act like you endorse it because the Christians that, or the so-called Christians that are endorsing the sin they're guilty of the same sin. Don't put yourself in that situation. Don't put yourself in that boat. And we've talked a lot about how homosexuality at its core is pride. What's the antidote to pride? Humility. That's what we're called to do. Because humility leads us to admit that we are incapable of making those decisions. It leads us to admit that we are not strong enough or mature enough on our own without God's help and his favor to make the decision of what is right and what is wrong. It leads us to seek out God's help and aid when it comes to these matters. When it's difficult to talk to somebody about this, God helps us with that too if we are humble and we ask for it. And so humility is the cure to this sin because pride is at its core. And if you are somebody that has those kinds of attractions, humility also leads you to say, look, God's the one that made me. He knows me better than I do, and he knows what lifestyle is going to ultimately make me better or ultimately make me worse. And I trust him enough, and I'm humble enough to understand that I don't have all the answers to believe that he does. That's where humility leads. If you want the antidote to that and pretty much every other sin— it boils down to humility because it will lead us to make those decisions. And it also will remind us that other people don't get to make that decision either. That if we're humble enough to say, look, I'm a human and, and that kind of decision is above my pay grade, we'll also say that for other people as well. We'll be humble enough to say, look, God says that this is wrong and, and he's higher than us. His ways are higher than our ways. 
And so if he says that it's not okay, there must be a good reason for that. Ultimately, I think that I could sum up this entire lesson in three little words. Tolerance is love. Stay the course, friends. To convince you to like this video and subscribe to my channel, I'm about to do some political impersonations. First up, Bernie Sanders. It is immoral that in this country, the top 1% of YouTubers get all the likes and subscriptions. John Kerry. Please remember to ring the notification bell. President Joe Biden. If you like the show, call the TV Guide and tell them. You know, the thing. Kamala Harris. Batman would want you to like and subscribe. 